is problematic. Why is it that in any dispute between men and women, men are automatically to blame? Why is it that homosexuals and the transgender are regarded as better people than heterosexuals? Well, the answer is cultural Marxism. So what is cultural Marxism? Well, interestingly, in the last talk, there was um, the Wikipedia page and the Infogalactic page for cultural Marxism. And if you go and look at cultural Marxism, it'll say that it's a theory of communism, which is not what we use the term for at all. And when I read the, uh, the theory of communism, it was rubbish. What we mean by cultural Marxism is that a communist theory, class warfare, has been adopted by liberalism and is now a mainstay of liberal political thought. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about liberalism, I'm going to talk about communism, and then I'm going to weave the two together. So what is liberalism? Liberalism is an idea that it is the dominant political philosophy of our lifetime, of our parents' lifetime, of their parents, and of their parents. And it doesn't matter whether you're 15 or 115, that's still true. And in the English-speaking world, liberalism has been the dominant political philosophy since 1688, the year of the Glorious Revolution. And it wasn't called liberalism, but all the basic ideas were there in 1688. And that basic idea is freedom. That there is nothing that people want more than to be free. That is the highest value that any person can have or want. Freedom, liberty, liberation. From what? From everything. That you are entirely self-made. That you get to decide what God, if any, you worship. You get to decide what king, if any, you serve. You get to decide every aspect of your life. And liberalism, like all of the political ideologies, is a Christian heresy. Specifically, a Protestant heresy. All of the political ideologies come from Europe, they come from Christianity, they come from Protestantism. And then they just scrub away the parts about God, the parts about the church, and they just put in their own philosophy. But they all have an end point, just like Christianity does. And liberalism says that the end point is the autonomous individual, the person who is entirely self-made. That's the end point. That's what it's all about, about creating that person, making you into that person, all of you all of us, billions and billions of people who have no relationship to any other, any other person. And that's supposed to be the liberal utopia. Communism. Communism basically says that life's unfair, that there are people who are really rich and people who are really poor, and that shouldn't exist. There should be a more equal society where everyone shares in the benefits. And communists ask themselves, well, how did that happen? How did it come to be that some people are really rich and other people are really poor? And they come up with an answer, and I think it's the correct one. And that's the means of production. That there are some, some things that create wealth, and the people who own that get rich. So people who own farms, factories, ships, they're all making money, so they get rich. So take that away from those people and have them held by the government. Every person has a stake in the government. Every person can be looked after by the government. None of us will be really rich and none of us will be really poor and we'll all just be in the middle, sort of all happy. But communism also believes in the perfect person. And the perfect person is created through class struggle. 
sometimes called class warfare. And basically what it says is, well, it asks the question, how do we get from the society we have to the perfect society, the classless society? And it says that we do it through class struggle, through class war. Now, when you and I think about class, we think about an upper class, middle class, a working class. Our terminology might change, but it's basically three social classes. But communism says there is two, exactly two. There is an oppressor class, and there is an oppressed class. And sometimes they say this is an exploiter class, and an exploited class. And how do you know whether you're what class you're in? If you are not being oppressed, you are an oppressor. If you are not being exploited, you are an exploiter. So that's why communists shoot monks. He's been in his cell for 50 years, he hasn't talked to anybody. And they drag him out and they shoot him. Why? Because he's an exploiter, he's an oppressor. Because when he, you ask him, hey, how's life? He goes, hey, it's pretty good. Well, it's pretty good, you're not being oppressed. You're an oppressor, you're the enemy. So what they say, if you can imagine two giant blocks of concrete, and they're, they're both suspended, and they're dragging against each other, and they're both solid, but of course, over time, they just wear away because of the, the friction. And that's the term the communists use, the friction. And eventually, there'll be nothing left of those blocks, just pebbles and dust. And then the communists say, they'll come along, and they'll sweep up the pebbles, and they'll sweep up the dust, and they'll make the new society from that. It's as nutty as it sounds. So how? did class warfare make its way into liberalism? Well, let's go back before the First World War, to back to Marx. Marx said that the workers in the cities and the towns, they were the revolutionary class. Capitalism would exploit them to such an extent that they would rise up and they would overthrow the system and then they would form the new society with the help of professional revolutionaries. The two of them would, would unite and create the classless society. Amen. 1914 comes along. Archduke Ferdinand is murdered. The world goes to war. And the communists say, this is it. Millions of men are putting on uniforms now they're being issued rifles and ammunition. They're not going to go and fight against other oppressed people. They're going to rise up and they're going to shoot their officers. They're going to shoot the aristocracy. They're going to shoot the businessmen. And that didn't happen. It didn't happen even a little bit. They were completely 100% wrong. And they wondered, what happened? And then 1917 comes. Russia has two revolutions in a year. They said, ah, oh. so it did happen. All right, we were, we were right, but it's just, just we were a few years out. All right, it did happen. But they still wondered, why didn't it happen everywhere else? But now we have the creation of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union created a intelligence service. Over the years, it went through many names, the OGPU, the KG, NKVD, the KGB, and it, of course, engaged in espionage, spying. So when we think of that, we think of trying to get other countries' battle plans, trying to find out about personalities, trying to find out about organisations, um, trying to find out about technology, weapons, economic secrets. And the Soviet Union did all of those things. But it actually placed a higher importance on agents of influence. And an agent of influence is somebody whose job is to push things in the correct direction. So there are two kinds of agents of influence. There are those who were directly recruited by the Soviet Union and they were directed what to do by the Soviet Union. 
And then there were fellow travellers, what Lenin called useful idiots. People who would support the Soviet Union, push the Soviet line, even though in the end, they'd be put up against the wall and shot when the rebel revolution actually arrives. So an example of the first kind is the Cambridge Spirey. In the 1930s, there were five men, young men, um, they went to Cambridge University. They all came from very privileged backgrounds. They all looked at the economic chaos of the Depression. And they said, this isn't right. They go to university. They meet people who are communists. They go, hey, this is the way of the future. Then they're recruited by Soviet intelligence. And they say to them, do not join the Communist Party. Do not join any front organization. So a front organisation is an organisation that supports the Soviet Union but claims to be neutral. So a classic example of this is the World Council of Churches, which always said, hey, the reason we support the Soviets so much is because their ideas are so brilliant. So these guys were recruited into British intelligence at the start of the Second World War where they passed information onto the Soviets, including about agents being sent into communist countries who were captured, tortured, executed. But what their ultimate job was, was to rise up in the service, get into a position of influence, and then to direct things to help the Soviet Union and to help communism. But this didn't just happen in the intelligence services. This happened in the churches. It happened in political parties. It happened in charities. It happened in everywhere. There's nowhere where this type of thing did not take place. So we talked about the first crisis of the 20th century, World War I. But then we get to the second, the Great Depression. And the communists said to themselves, Capitalism has failed. Look around you. Everywhere you look, one in five men have lost their jobs. In some countries, one in four men lost their jobs. In some countries, Australia one of them, one in three. One in three men had no jobs. Very basic social security. They actually had to introduce new legislation to stop people from starving. The communists said, this is it. This is where it gets serious. This is where we take over. But it didn't happen. There was no revolution. And even people who were not communists, even people who were anti-communist, said, wow, we were really shocked by that outcome. We thought there was going to be a revolution too. Because actually it sounded like what the communists were saying was right. Then we come to the third great crisis of the 20th century. World War II. Now, there's many great historical events that took place in World War II, but what's important in the story of cultural Marxism is what did not happen during World War II. What didn't happen was that economic life was um, directed towards a war effort. Normal economic life didn't go on. Social life didn't go on. It was directed towards a war effort. And political life didn't go on. It was a time of national unity. Everyone had to be on the same side. So all those men who in normal circumstances would be writing pamphlets, recruiting people, worrying about finance, they're sitting around doing nothing. So what do you do when you're doing nothing? You start thinking. And they went back and started looking at 1914. What happened in 1914? Why didn't they rise up? What happened in 1929? Why didn't they rise up? And a very shocking conclusion started to, to come out. And that was, hey, maybe Marx is wrong. Communism's correct. But maybe Marx is wrong. Maybe when Marx said the workers are the revolutionary class, Maybe that ain't true. Because here we are in the middle of World War II, and we're all the young men. They're all in uniform. 
They all flock to the colours. But what happens when you go to war? A lot of men die, and they still go. Why? Because they're patriotic. And the communists aren't really happy with that. How do you break that? Because if you love your country, how can you love an ideology, an abstraction? So what they do is they start looking around for an answer. And what they're really looking for is someone to replace the white working class as the revolutionary class. And then they come across a very obscure ideology, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism. It had existed for more than 100 years, but it was obscure. There were no bestsellers in this, this genre. <coughs> but they started looking at it and they went, hey, maybe this is the answer. Maybe it's the coloured races that will actually provide the revolutionary impetus. So the first thing is they have to be liberated from the European yoke. The European colonial empires, they have to end. And secondly, we want some of that revolutionary vigour here. Now, there's no evidence that they're actually revolutionary, just like there was no evidence that the white working class was revolutionary. But that's the way they think. As these conversations are going on, there are liberals who are hearing these conversations as well and start joining in. And what they start hearing about is the word liberation, liberty, freedom. These are the very lifeblood of liberalism. And you're like, you know what? You're right. All these colonial empires, they're oppressing these people. These people have a right to be free. The empires have to go. And you know, it would be great if we got people into the West who weren't so patriotic. Because, you know, we agree with you communists. This patriotism thing, it's, it's, a real, it's a real stop on the autonomous individual. People don't want to be individuals because they're a group. There are millions and millions of people in this group. And we have to break this group up so that they can become just individuals. So these two forces are starting to converge. What's interesting is that in 1939, you don't hear talk about immigration. Sure, you hear about the uh, Jewish refugees, but the resistance to that is immense. But by 1944, 45, you go and look at Britain, Canada, Australia, the United States, you start to see all of these countries. In the background, people are talking about, hey, you know what? We need a lot more, a lot more immigration. We need a lot more people who are us here. And that wasn't happening at the start of the war. Why? Because during the war, this deep thinking took place. And that transformed everything. It transformed as much as the actual fighting did. Then we come to the Cold War. And the Cold War, as far as the communists are concerned, it's, it's the final straw. The communist theorists talked to each other about why did why did the workers go off and fight in World War I? And someone would say, well, you know, it was imperial against imperial Germany. Of course the workers are against imperialism. Uh, what about World War II? Well, of course the workers are against fascism. Uh, why are the workers against the Soviet Union? Why are they against communism in the Cold War? Well, the communists didn't really have a good answer for that one. So here they are starting to make a major withdrawal from the idea that the working class, who are white, are the revolutionary class. Then 1956, there are two crises within communism. Firstly, Premier Khrushchev of the Soviet Union denounces Stalin. This causes a massive rift in the communist world, by which I mean the ideological world. People are like, who do we follow? Do we follow Stalin, 
who we love, and they did love him, or do we follow Khrushchev, who's the new boss? And the communist parties around the Western world began to break, just like there was no evidence that the white working class was revolutionary. But that's the way they think. As these conversations are going on, there are liberals who are hearing these conversations as well and start joining in. And what they start hearing about is the word liberation, liberty, freedom. These are the very lifeblood of liberalism. You're like, you know what? You're right. All these colonial empires, they're oppressing these people. These people have a right to be free. The empires have to go. And you know, it would be great if we got people into the West who weren't so patriotic. Because, you know, they agree with you, communists. This patriotism thing, it's, it's a real, it's a real stop on the autonomous individual. People don't want to be individuals because they're a group. There are millions and millions of people in this group. We have to break this group up so that they can become just individuals. So these two forces are starting to converge. What's interesting is that in 1939, you don't hear talk about immigration. Sure, you hear about the uh, Jewish refugees, but the resistance to that is immense. But by 1944, 45, you go and look at Britain, Canada, Australia, the United States, you start to see all of these countries in the background, people are talking about, hey, you know what? We need a lot more, a lot more immigration. We need a lot more people who aren't us here. And that wasn't happening at the start of the war. Why? Because during the war, this deep thinking took place and that transformed everything. It transformed as much as the actual fighting did. Then we come to the Cold War. And the Cold War, as far as the communists are concerned, it's, it's the final straw. The communist theorists talked to each other about why did why did the workers go off and fight in World War I? And someone would say, well, you know, it was imperial against imperial Germany. Of course the workers are against imperialism. Oh. What about World War II? Well, of course the workers are against fascism. Okay. Why are the workers against the Soviet Union? Why are they against communism in the Cold War? Well, the communists didn't really have a good answer for that one. So here they are starting to make a major withdrawal from the idea that the working class, who are white, are the revolutionary class. And then 1956, there are two crises within communism. Firstly, Premier Khrushchev of the Soviet Union denounces Stalin. This causes a massive rift in the communist world, by which I mean the ideological world. People are like, who do we follow? Do we follow Stalin, who we love? And they did love him. Or do we follow Khrushchev, who's the new boss? And the communist parties around the Western world began to break up. And then it was followed only a few months later by the Soviet invasion of Hungary. Hungary had fought against the Soviet Union in the Second World War. It had been defeated, it had been occupied, a communist government had been installed, a Hungarian government. By 1956, the Hungarian government, the Hungarian communist government said, hey, Stalin's dead, let's liberalise things a bit. But they forgot to ask Moscow whether that was all right. It turns out it wasn't. So the Soviet Union invaded. People died, it was fighting. But all over the world, the Soviet Union was condemned from left to right. People said, you know, how, how can you do this to someone who you're allied to? How can you invade your ally? And that is the high watermark of communism in the West, 1956. Because in 1956, millions of people throw away their membership cards, don't renew, 
and you can actually see the numbers in the history. You can go back and, and look at the millions of people just go, no, I'm over. Communism, I'm over. But those who are left are obviously pretty hardcore. But what they're now left with is, what do we do? We had a plan. Our plan was that we would continue to grow in membership and we would contest elections and we would win government and we would subvert the system from, from within and produce the communist government that way. And now there's not even, there's not a chance at all of this. So then they say, well, we've got to go and find causes that we can support that will advance the cause of, Mar of Marxism, of communism. That brings them in to back into, um, into contact with liberals. Now, at the same time, liberalism has been evolving as well. In the 1850s, liberalism was very different to what it was in the 1950s. In the 1850s, everything was about freedom. All right? You should be free, your country should be free, your money should be free, workers should be free to move around, you should be free to get workers from anywhere you want, your goods should be free, they should be able to travel anywhere. By 1950, practically none of that's true. In 1950, there's money controls, there's tariffs, there's uh, a restriction on movements of people, and there are a lot of people within liberalism who are saying, hey, we used to have these great ideas and we don't have them anymore. Why not? So they began to split. And at the time, they were called dries because they were interested in dry economics. Everything had to make economic sense. Economic rationalism was one of the causes that they, they espoused. But then there was another group who, who were also liberals, and they were left, or cultural liberals. And they said, culture is what is, what's important. You know, we, people are, are manual. You know, so we need to control the education system so people can be taught the right things so they'll become the right person. You know, we need to control um, the media. We need to, to get all these influences in all these areas so that we can determine how people will think, how people will turn out. So liberalism splits, it actually splits into a number of factions, but the two main ones are right liberalism and left liberalism. Economic liberalism, social liberalism. Right liberalism, everything is about money. Everything is about economics. The left, everything is about culture. Everything is about society. So here in the late 50s, you see the left liberals and the communists starting to, to join up. They start supporting the same causes in a big, big way. They had it in the past a little bit, but now it was, you couldn't really tell the difference between the two. And the big thing, the very first big test of cultural Marxism was the American Civil Rights Movement. So you have people in the south of the United States who are saying that black people don't have the same rights that white people have. And then people come in and say, well, what you're saying is black people are oppressed. And they say, yes, that's right. Well, who's oppressing them? Well, those people. Well, those people are white. So you have class struggle. You have people being oppressed. You have people who are their oppressors. And you can go onto YouTube and look at interviews from the 1950s, and you'll see that they're talking in this language. There are oppressors and there are the oppressed. And then in the 60s, we get feminism, a revival of feminism. Feminism is actually a lot older than that. And it fits into the same, same narrative straight away. Women, why, don't, why, aren't, why aren't women having all the same benefits in life as men? Because, you know, all of our lives are all benefits, right? 
and uh, it's because women are oppressed but if someone's being oppressed someone has to be the oppressor so who's the oppressor men and then we get the gay liberation movement well they're being oppressed who's oppressing them everyone who's not a homosexual See, so that's where we are today. Where these, this idea of class warfare has been brought into liberalism, step by step. Before most of us were born, it was already here. And now we have to deal with it. And uh, it's very difficult because, just to give one example, um, our Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, a few months ago he sent out a tweet saying that uh, there shouldn't be gender whisperers in our schools. Children should be children. And of course the left attacked him. We say the left, but really it's liberalism attacked him. But actually most people would agree with him. But here's the question I have. If is that is his real position, why doesn't he do something about it? I mean, he's the Prime Minister. Sure, he can't just snap his fingers, but surely there's something that you and I should be able to see that he is actually trying to get rid of this awful transgenderism ideology. But he's not. Why not? Because he supports cultural Marxism. Now, if he walked in the room right now and said to me, that's outrageous. That's, that's, I, I don't believe that at all. But what's he actually doing to combat it? The truth is that he does believe in it, even though he denies it, or would. And the same is true of our churches, of our charities, of our governments, everywhere. That's why we have to get together and start fighting back. Thank you.